Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. So on today's episode, we will be discussing J.K. Rowling's tweets and her blog posts about trans people from last week. We believe as a group that these comments were wrong and hurtful on multiple levels. And the purpose of this episode is to explain why we feel this way. And we're hoping to educate you and give you perspective. And later, we will discuss how we go from here as fans and as hosts of a Harry Potter podcast, because this really did shake the fandom over the past week. And while we hope to enlighten and change minds, I also just want to add that we will probably not talk about this again, because J.K. Rowling has made it abundantly clear where she stands now, and we don't need to keep digging into this. We are a Harry Potter podcast. We want to we want to stick to Harry Potter. And I know a lot of listeners might be saying, why do you guys have to talk about it? Because it's important, and we really do believe that. And to help us discuss this today, we are joined by our friend, Dr. Sarah Steelman. She has a PhD. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist specializing in LGBTQ plus affirmative practices. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hello. I'm happy to be here. I wish it was better circumstances, but teenage me is thrilled nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sarah has been a longtime listener of the show. We've met her many times. We've hung out many times. She is a wonderful person. And we're so excited to have you here because you really know what you're talking about. We, I think the, the rest of the panel here will be the first to admit we are not experts. We are not perfect when discussing these types of topics. So we wanted to bring on somebody who has expertise here. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you touched on it earlier with the education piece. This show is today is not just about educating our listeners. In many ways, it's about educating ourselves as hosts. And I think that that's exactly why Sarah is here. She is the expert. And I know we've gotten a number of emails. We've gotten a number of tweets about not rushing to judgment about this particular situation. And I would say that's exactly what we're not doing, right? That's why we have an expert on. That's why we've taken a couple days to digest everything that's been put out there. And hopefully people take something away from the show today. Yeah. And before we dive into our main discussion, we did want to give a brief trigger warning. Today's show will contain a lot of unaffirmative and transphobic language. Due to the nature of the discussion, these words and quotes will need to be said as they were written without correcting the language to be more affirmative. If hearing these words is too triggering for you, please protect your mental health, and it is okay to pause or stop the episode as you need. If you need support, we do have a couple of resources to point you towards. You can call the Trevor Project at 866-488-7386, and you can also call the Trans Lifeline at 877-565-8860. So we recorded episode 468 last Saturday, Saturday morning, and we go and try to have a peaceful weekend. And I'm sitting on the couch, bored out of my mind, refreshing Twitter. And here comes a tweet from J.K. Rowling. She shares an article with the headline, Opinion, Creating a More Equal Post-COVID-19 World for People Who Menstruate. She quotes this link. She says, people who menstruate. I'm sure there used to be a word for those people. Someone help me out. One Ben? Wimpunt? Woomud? She's mad that they used people instead of women. And, of course, people started freaking out because she was, once again, being transphobic. And, of course, rip her mentions immediately. This isn't just an errant like. This isn't what publicists may refer to as a middle-aged moment. It's not... J.K. Rowling following people. These have been people have been telling us, trans listeners have been writing in for ages saying, these are problematic. This is what J.K. Rowling's doing. She's friending all these people who are self-described gender critical, et cetera. This was J.K. Rowling in the middle of nowhere, seemingly a propos of nothing, finding fault with a politically right. correct statement. While she was back on Twitter to promote this new free children's book, like she brought up in her blog post. So Rip Her mentions, then Rowling follows up with a Twitter thread and she says, if sex isn't real, there's no same sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. The idea that women like me, who have been empathetic to trans people for decades, feeling kinship because they're vulnerable in the same way as women, i.e. to male violence, hate trans people because they think sex is real and has lived consequences, is a nonsense. 
I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I'd march with you if you were discriminated against on the basis of being trans. At the same time, my life has been shaped by being female. I do not believe it's hateful to say so. And then she goes to bed. And then Twitter continues to respond to her, and people are really upset about this. Before we get into the blog post that she wrote a few days later, Sarah, can you tell us why everything she just said on Saturday night was offensive and wrong? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> a few things. Um, let's just let's just discuss some of the language that she used. So first of all, same sex attraction. That's something we we now mostly say same gender attraction or we just say lgb or queer and so we've already started to remove that from sex but um i think she's her internet's lost somewhere in the early 2000s or 90s <laughs> but sex as she is talking about it is what we affirmatively refer to as what you are assigned at birth and so you may have heard the terms afab or amab um afab would mean that you are assigned female at birth ABAB means that you are assigned male at birth. And the reason why we discuss this is because, one, it feels better for trans people. Um, it doesn't make the um, distinction between being real, quote unquote, or not real in your identity. Um, but also, sex is not actually this binary. It's a spectrum always. And people are intersex, and they are not assigned intersex at birth sometimes uh there are ways to know if someone is intersex and there are actually a lot of corrective surgeries that are done almost immediately after birth for that or there's some chromosomal issue or something like that that is either never discovered or discovered way later and this is also true of people who are AFAB or AMAB, where you can have chromosome um a different different chromosome than what you would typically expect of a woman or a man. Um, you can have hormonal issues that cause issues with menstruation. There are lots of cis women who do not menstruate. Um, and so this is just a little bit about some of the words that she used that were wrong. Um, and then for gender, that is what we know as how people identify, what roles and scripts they see themselves as filling, their relationships to society, how they view themselves internally. And these can be changed in terms of labels throughout the lifespan, but it has been found over and over again scholarly to not be able to be changed, which is why conversion therapy is unethical to do in almost any therapeutic licensure. It is harmful and <laughs> it doesn't work. And there are lots of studies and legitimate science if you are interested in kind of understanding why or how we know that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, one question I had here is is looking at these tweets, why could they potentially be misleading or misinformative to to the average person looking at the tweet and saying, oh, it's just JK Rowling tweeting again? Because I think that that has happened a lot, as it did back in December. Yeah. And I think that something that a lot of uh people try to discuss when they are saying why they don't support a marginalized population is they make an argument that the marginalized population is not making. So here, the argument she's using is, my experience has been shaped by being female. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, no one is questioning that. <laughs> and honestly, if, if anyone here has spoken with trans people, they understand that they have had their experience shaped by how they were socialized what they were assigned at birth. Like this isn't a novel concept or something that trans people don't already think. Mm -hmm. Being trans does not mean automatically that you are like as far left as you can go politically and like want to burn all categories. There are a lot of trans people that I work with that are more conservative or more traditional in kind of their beliefs about what gender is and what gender roles they should follow. And this connection to all trans people believe that like sex doesn't exist or being female doesn't have lived consequences is not what anyone is saying mm -hmm. besides jk rowling apparently yeah and we wanted to talk a little bit about why we think jk rowling may be doing this now why she's been consistently doing this 
especially for the last six months or so, we actually got a really great email from Anna, who resides in Scotland, about the Scottish Gender Recognition Act. Scotland is currently looking to um, reform its 2004 Gender Recognition Act in order to make gender recognition more accessible to trans people living in Scotland. Of course, J.K. Rowling also lives in Scotland. Um, Something that I observed when I looked up the um, recommendation from Scottish Parliament about the Gender Recognition Act is that it was published on December 17th of last year. And of course, we all remember that J.K. Rowling's um, December tweet about Maya Forstey Forstater, Forstater, I always forget her last name. Um, that came on December 19th. Um, mm-hmm. So it seems possible that J.K. Rowling may have been made aware of this around the time it was published and that that sort of uh, incentivized her to start speaking out on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, like, uh, I hear a lot of people on Twitter and in the fandom. I've been in this fandom for my entire life practically um like i started listening to bubble cast in 2006 and attending harry potter conferences that year as well and so uh, a lot of things that i have been seeing have been supportive of trans people and dismissing jk rowling's statement but for some people that may not understand why this is so harmful i mean yesterday we had from try and set limitations on healthcare for trans people. And you have to do a lot of reading. And some of it, I think you have to understand um, kind of how trans healthcare already works because you might think right away, okay, this limits like access to trans affirmative care, which Mm -hmm. some people may or may not already see as cosmetic or optional procedures. But this also limits whether or not trans men are able to get hysterectomies, whether they are able to get tested for ovarian cancer, whether trans women can get prostate exams, it it disrupts and will kill a lot of people because we have care that we have gendered and we are trying, and by we, I mean the Trump administration and the US is trying to limit whether or not these things will be allowed to be done through insurance. And we all know through insurance that if you can't get a very serious procedure or sometimes a very simple procedure done, you are potentially going bankrupt doing it out of pocket. And so this is a huge problem. And it, if it does pass, will have a very deadly effect on trans people. It really seems like a global effort or a global affront is is taking place that's been taking place over the last couple of years but really this this movement really seems to be it crosses country borders really yes and, and i think it's one of the fights of of our generation agreed i'd also like to point out to sarah's point about this move by the trump administration here in the u.s that happened on the fourth anniversary of the pulse nightclub shooting and i don't think that's a coincidence in pride month too yeah, it, during Pride Month, it feels like a massive dog whistle. Um, and that is exactly why, um, and Sarah, you can let me know if this is accurate, it's exactly why this kind of rhetoric is dangerous. Now, dog whistle, I wanted to redefine that term. We've heard it only once before on the show that I can recall. Essentially a type of virtue signaling. You could easily say, and people do, that it's, it's just one person's opinion and this isn't like we shouldn't get outraged about it but there's a few issues with that in general when people state opinions like this um but particularly when jk rowling states an opinion like this because these opinions are not from nowhere like if it truly was jk rowling on an island by herself and like please let that happen but if that's what was happening and she just had this opinion and was stating it into a void Okay, that probably doesn't have a ton of ripples societally, but these are very well-known opinions. These are opinions that she is shouting at a very, very large platform. These are opinions that she is shouting when, you know, she has a lot of money and politics is often run by money. And so there is a lot of ability that she has more than just her words that we don't know about to influence how laws 
pass, how policies pass. And that is true everywhere. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times um, there there's within therapy in general, a lot of times what people are coming in for is internalized problems. And so bad communication, like dis- issues with forming uh, positive relationships, trust issues, things that they can sit in my office and I can be like, here is how you fix this. Yeah. And when when you work with marginalized folk, and I work primarily with trans people, they are coming in because outside of my office, in their life, there are these issues. And those are things that they cannot fix. Yeah. They are coming in because there are bureaucratic issues that allow them to be misgendered or to not get the care that they need. They are coming in because they have in, in Nevada where I live, luckily we have a lot of state protections, but not every state does. Um, and so they are coming in because the world is actively against them in a lot of ways. And this is how the world became actively against them is people have these opinions and we for an unknown reason said that they were allowed their opinion more than we said that these trans people were allowed to live. Yeah. And for just one example of the impact, we wanted to share an email from a listener who wrote in. This is from Colin and Colin says, I'm a transgender man, meaning I was assigned female at birth and Harry Potter has always been a really important part of my life. I started reading the books when I was seven and I'm 20 now. I'm a gay man. I've had relationships with gay men, and it's never been an issue, not once. This kind of talk just further divides the LGBT community, and it's been a talking point for hateful fringe parts of the cis gay community for decades. It really hurts to have to recognize that these beliefs are part of the person who created my favorite series, and it hurts even more that she's doubling down even now. I know it can be hard to accept something is true when you don't want it to be, especially about someone you look up to. So I hope the people struggling with that right now recognize how much more painful it is for the people this is directly aimed at. A big part of transitioning is making it through all the people who are questioning you and think that they know you better than you do. It's really painful that a woman whose work was such an important part of my childhood is one of them. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Colin. And so before we get to J.K. Rowling's blog post, I just want to highlight some of the responses from Harry Potter actors. These came at a surprise, starting with Dan Radcliffe on June 8th, who spoke out. I don't think anybody saw this coming. Dan Radcliffe is very separated from Harry Potter these days, but he's actually been very involved with the Trevor Project. Laura mentioned it at the top of the show. This is a hotline for LGBTQ people to call at any time for some free counseling. He posted on the Trevor Project's website a statement in response to J.K. Rowling's thoughts and came out against her pretty strongly. He said, As someone who has been honored to work with and continues to contribute to the Trevor Project for the last decade, and just as a human being, I feel compelled to say something in this moment. Transgender women are women. Any statement to the contrary erases the identity and dignity of transgender people and goes against all advice given by professional healthcare associations who have far more expertise on this subject matter than either Joe or I. And he says more, but we will get into that later in the show. On the point of of Dan, on the point of Colin's email so far, is empathy. This comes down to Mm -hmm. how much empathy you have for people who suffer from being marginalized. And I I think that I get a lot of empathy reading Dan's statement. I do not get Mm -hmm. a lot of empathy reading Joe's uh, sarcastic retort on Twitter about people who menstruate. And that's going to, I think be a through line as we continue discussing this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just add to I, I think it's it's also about education, right? For people like myself who just are not familiar enough. And I think that that's part of doing the show. That's part about having these conversations because if if you're able to better educate yourself and understand that goes a long way as well. That's to me in tandem with being empathetic towards other people and who they are. And that's one thing I appreciated from uh, Dan's statement is, as far as I'm aware, is the only Harry Potter uh, response person who has said that there are people who have far more expertise on the subject. 
than him <laughs> yeah. or Joe. Yeah. And that's one thing that obviously I would notice because that's another issue. I mean, that's a whole 2020 vibe right now of not trusting expertise and not understanding that expertise exists. Like you watch one YouTube video and you think you're a genius on the matter. And so yeah, right. that's another thing that occurs is, and JK Rowling, her, her statement is coded with language that does make it seem like she is an expert. And a lot of people, when they do state opinions, if they are in positions of power, can make their opinions seem like fact. Um, and we, we know all too well that that works. And so I appreciated that, like, this isn't, this isn't some, like, weird thing just happening online or that Joe thinks is new to the world. Um, this has been studied for decades. This has been worked on for as long. Th this is converse these are conversations that are already happening and we know a lot more about it than what we put on Twitter. Even given recent events, I think we're seeing more so that uh you know, people are are not being silent about things anymore, even if it's uncomfortable. And I think that goes a long way in terms of allyship. So on June 10th, Emma Watson came out against J.K. Rowling's statement as well. She said trans people are who they say they are and deserve to live their lives without being constantly questioned or told they aren't who they say they are. And then on June 12th, Rupert Grint completed the trifecta and issued a similar statement. I saw this funny tweet on Twitter. These statements literally came in true trio order. Harry, bold yet dramatic. Hermione, eloquent yet pedantic. And Ron, loyal yet late. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the solidarity. Noma um, Bonnie Wright, Eddie Redmayne, you know, famously, I think. Ivana he, Lynch. He, Ivana Lynch followed Dan. Mm. All of these actors. Dan Fogler now as well um yeah and i will say it was gutsier for eddie redmayne and dan fogler to come out in support of trans people and against jk rowling statements because they still work for jk rowling <laughs> it was gutsy for dan and and rupert and emma for sure but they still have to go and see her yeah and in fact on friday night the screenwriter who's working with jk rowling on fantastic beast 3 and who wrote seven of the eight harry potter movies steve clovez he came out against uh, J.K. Rowling's statement as well. So a lot of people are, are speaking out about this and good for them because mm -hmm. they could have just stayed silent to not annoy their boss. Um, somebody who did uh, play it safe was Warner Brothers, but we'll get to that at the end of the show. <laughs> well, one one statement that's apparent in, in, in many, if not all of these Harry Potter cast and crew statements is trans women are women, trans men are men. Something Something as simple as that line far exceeds the level to which J.K. Rowling is willing to go uh, in in her long 3,700-word response. She does not once allow trans people the dignity of saying anything as direct as that one line. And I that's that's huge to me. Yeah, she gets close at some points, and then she just flies in a different direction. I'm like, you were, mm -hmm. you were almost there. You were almost yeah. there. <laughs> It's almost as if by saying that line, that it's a rebuke to J.K. Rowling's whole point, to everything that she's doing. I mean, the fact that these stars spoke out is not a coincidence. It's because it needed to be spoken, because people are in pain, because people are hurting, and it's not- Trans people need deal. our support. Yeah. So let's talk about this article. She posted this on jkrowling.com under the headline, J.K. Rowling writes about her reasons for speaking out on sex and gender issues. I just want to point out first that there is not a single link and only two um, citations in this entire 3,000 plus word blog post. And I mm. find that very irresponsible because she is sharing a lot of information. You really have to step back for a second and think about why she is not linking to her sources. In addition to publishing this, uh, she did put it out on Twitter. And the only words that were utilized in the tweet were turf wars. And I wonder, Sarah, can you just explain what a turf is? Because I think probably a lot of our listeners aren't aware of what that term means. Yeah. So TERF stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. And TERF is a word used when people are excluding trans people from feminism and not acknowledging trans existence. Um, actually, I mean, TERF is discussed by TERFs as being a slur, 
Um, it's actually kinder than I think it should be. Like for those who follow feminism and like the different waves of feminism, not just like understand that feminism is a thing. Radical feminism is not really what most TERFs are doing is used as a descriptor. Um, and it is describing the statements that are being made. Um, but a lot of people who are called TERFs, uh, pretend as though it is a slur, especially as though it is a slur against cis women. And that will come up a lot mm-hmm. in the statement. When we had Rory Porter on, uh, she said, she told us that turf was actually a term created by that movement, that it was not in fact, as JK Rowling claims in her article, uh, coined by trans activists. I think it actually might be. I don't, I don't remember the origin of turf, but that, that would not surprise me if that were true. Because again, a lot of people like they they're not radical feminists and so it is a a bit of a weird thing that i think trans activists would pick up on more and so that that makes a lot more sense in like the history of the term (laughs) uh sarah i wanted to ask if you think this could be a fair historical comparison in you know an earlier wave of feminism um you know before any of us were born feminism or at least mainstream feminism did not include lesbians, for example. Yeah. Is that a similar sort of thing that's happening here with trans-exclusionary radical feminism? A little bit. So yeah, there there used to be, I mean, I I think a, a lot of what it comes down to is feminism. There are many waves, there are many scholars and historical like activists and people involved in feminism. And they think different things, which is why there's different strands of feminism. And so um, a lot of what TERFs are relying on is essentialism arguments. And so what essentialism is, is, I mean, hopefully exactly as it sounds, like that there is an innate womanhood, this is what it is, and like that's kind of it. And so essentialism itself is not very widely utilized or like highly regarded in a lot of scholarship anymore there are obviously some people that still hold essentialist views um but we're not really there a lot of scholarship is discussing like social constructionism um which is you know gender is a construct you might have heard before um that's where that comes from and so that's the other issue that Andrew already brought up. I mean, she doesn't cite her sources, but she also, she's going into lots of different waves. And so you can't follow her argument. Like, even if she cited it, she would probably, like, it, it, let's pretend that this was like a peer reviewed journal. Um, and if that were the case, she would be citing so many contradictory people that it would never get published. Like there would be every reviewer would be like, you can't have this person's thoughts and this person's thoughts together. Like they think different things. <laughs> right, right. And there are a lot of statements in this blog post that contradict each other. I mean, just on their face. It's, it's, I found it really irresponsible. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of treat this like a chapter by chapter segment. I think we're going to pull out some quotes and dive into, um, our reactions to them and why they're wrong. And in the show, look, we could spend seriously, I'm not joking, six hours talking about this, Mm -hmm. but we're going to try to do it in like 30, 45 minutes. I mean, here's the thing. I, I, I read this and my overall impression, like coming away, I was like, I initially saw that she had written a post on her website, I said, thank God, we're finally going to get her opinion on on this. And I'm I'm finally going to be able to understand because Twitter's not the best way. Everybody knows Twitter's not the best way to like communicate. Everybody knows that. But, and and after reading this article, it's very long. I read it and I, I came away going, huh, like, okay, JK Rowling is not a bad person. She's just really, really, really concerned about the state of uh, current uh, politics and gender identity and all that stuff. And I came away and I walked away going, she's just, she's really concerned about this. And it's almost like that new meme where you're reading something and you go, checks notes. It's like, okay, so JK Rowling's a nice person. She just checks notes, is afraid that transgender women are going to violate women's spaces in the bathrooms and attack women? 
Like mm -hmm. it almost doesn't. Which, what's, which for the record never happens. Which, yeah. Which is when, when transgender women have problems in the bathroom, it's because cis people are uncomfortable with them being there. And cis people are the instigators of many of these reported results. I've done some research after this, but like, is that the major theme of this then? Because it's hidden behind a lot of I feel statements, which we're inclined to sympathize with because it's J.K. Rowling, the woman who we've regarded for so long. But like I myself, like I hate how much I was swayed at first by what seemed to be a really concerned woman with a lot of legitimate concerns about the world today. And, th and that's something that will come up a lot through different quotes that we highlight um she uses a lot of like common logical fallacies in order to to trap you in that and the way that that i mean it works well because uh, not a lot of people are experts in this not even a lot of trans people are and so there are the, i i was reached out by some trans people when i was posting on twitter about this like not all trans people even disagree with jk rowling most do mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this is something that I think absolutely like it, it is very easy to fall into the very pretty language that she used to construct her argument. And she leads you in the direction she wants to lead you. Yeah. And she I, tries to be friendly and funny at points, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's condescending. <laughs> it just seems so manipulative. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah, it, it goes back to even when we were talking about the tweets earlier on the surface level, if that's all you're reading at you can walk away and, and not necessarily feel one way or the other or not understand what the whole to-do is about. Uh, but I, I wanted to start off at the beginning here because I think it's interesting to see how she first got involved with even thinking about trans issues. And in her open letter, she says that it was really professional uh, she said, on one level, my interest in this issue has been professional because I'm writing a crime series. She's referring to the Corman Strike series set in the present day. And my fictional female detective, whose name is Robin, is of an age to be interested in and affected by these issues herself. And you know, I've read all of the Corman Strike novels to date. My question was, affected in what respect? Uh, we know, at least in one of the books, this character encounters another character uh, in the silkworm and the character that's encountered, her name is Pippa. She's a transgender woman undergoing therapy ahead of gender reassignment surgery. Uh, and again, I, I don't think we need to jump in necessarily to the story, but this seems to have been her entry point into having conversations and it, and learning about the trans community. I mean, I love this quote, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, to be of an age to be interested in, um, what age is that exactly to be, to be, yes. to be affected by transgenderism because, because trans folks are affected by this their whole lives. So what level yeah. of privilege is this right here? So what, what she's talking about, and this is a, again, another three points. I'll talk more about this later because this is, um, one of the main sources that she cited is Lisa Lippman. And this is a huge, um, Lisa's article or uh, peer-reviewed publication came out in 2018 um, and then was republished in 2019. But the the thing that is most used in TERF spaces um, is what is known as rapid onset gender dysphoria. And so what this is referring to, which again is not clear if you hadn't already read the publication before the statement, as I had, that... It is talking about how teenagers huddle up in teenage groups and all become trans. And so I could not believe that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite a lot. So again, there's a lot of points with this. I'm gonna I want to discuss it later when she actually discusses uh this as evidence, because it's the, one of the only things that she uses. But yeah, be have it be known like almost a, most of the language, if it seems kind of weird or particular. A lot of it is really referring to this one publication, which is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And and also, J.K. Rowling does not have to have this type of storyline in her books. She's acting like, oh, because it's set in present day, I just have to research this and have to include it. No, you don't. 
you're still writing a fictional world. Well, and not to mention and the if, character of Pippa is like uh, uh, the world's worst um, stereotype of transgender uh, women. And uh, Cormoran himself threatens Pippa with rape, uh, prison rape. I didn't I didn't know that. I've never read this, but I was what I was about to say is that I'm sure that even in her research, quote unquote, it's not even accurate because, I mean, you don't there is no minimum therapy requirement to receive a therapeutic support letter for gender reassignment surgery um, or what we know is gender affirmation surgeries. And so my assumption is, is that this book writes about it in very outdated terms that aren't common ethical practice right now. So ugh, yikes, a lot of yikes. Yeah. I- I'm sure we could definitely do an entire episode just digging into these issues as they pertain specifically to the silkworm, uh, but wanted to highlight another quote that she had in her open letter, one that was almost digging for sympathy, I would say. Um, and she said, what I didn't expect in the aftermath of my cancellation, and then she's talking about her Twitter cancellation, was the avalanche of emails and letters that came showering down upon me, the overwhelming majority of which were positive, grateful, and supportive. They came from a cross-section of kind, empathetic, and intelligent people, some of them working in fields dealing with gender dysphoria and trans people, who are all deeply concerned about the way a sociopolitical concept is influencing politics, medical practice, and safeguarding. She really wanted to let us know that some people are on her side. And like, yeah, okay, great. When you have 14 million followers on Twitter, I would expect some people to agree with you. Like, yeah. congratulations. But if, if you're not going to name people, though, like it, influencing politics, medical practice and safeguarding, that's not like, who are you talking about? <laughs> are mm-hmm. they actually people that are credible and are well known for working within this space? And right. t- what I what I am viewing this whole thing as is if, if J.K. Rowling isn't talking about it, I am like assuming that either she is not actually hearing from these people or she is hearing from people that are not very credible because at the times when someone does seem credible again such as lisa Littman, she discusses in great detail who this person is um Mm -hmm. she is very name droppy about it and so i don't i don't i don't buy it this is this is incorrect. <laughs> yeah, I saw on Twitter this this quote, working in fields dealing with gender dysphoria, uh, somebody said, yeah, like a bathroom architect could claim to work in this field. <laughs> like, are, the, are those people emailing Joe? Like, like who's emailing Joe? But this, what, what bothers me the most about this is she says that all of these people are, are um, kind, empathetic, intelligent. If they saw what she posted on Twitter in December, which is uh, live how you like, you know, dress how you like, feel the way you want to feel, and and, and that very standoffish gender cancellation, trans cancellation tweet. How could you? How could anybody respond to that? Going, yeah, Joe, you're right. How are those empathetic, kind people? Because mm-hmm. she was spewing hate when people replied to that. So, what about it makes them kind and empathetic? They agree with her. It's yeah. it's <laughs> honestly just a. a it's a better worded version of the many people are saying argument that we hear a yeah. lot nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It also in a way has an underlying implication that those who are in opposition to her are not kind, empathetic or intelligent. Yeah. Which she directly says later in the statement. And so, yeah, she is, she is painting a picture and this is a picture that she's painting. I don't know why she's choosing to paint this. <laughs> she also said, I'd stepped back from Twitter for many months, both before and after tweeting support for Maya, because I knew it was doing nothing good for my mental health. That is something we suspected. And look, we understand. Twitter can be a, a bad, dark, dark place. And then she says, ironically, radical feminists aren't even trans exclu- exclusionary. They include trans men in their feminism because they were born women. Oof. Sarah, what is wrong with this? No, they weren't. They were assigned female at birth and also widely known about feminism, not just about women. The patriarchy affects men and women. And so Mm -hmm. 
this was one of the funnier things to me when reading the statement was how when she was like trying to paint her argument she accidentally said the exact transphobic thing she was being accused of instead of her flowery language like yeah if you are calling trans men women that is the that is the point like that is the problem with everything you are thinking but that goes in line with what she said about people who menstruate are women right yeah and and i mean it that isn't even true medically there are lots of cis women who don't menstruate either by choice through like birth control or through um like a medical issue where they have to have uh surgery done they have polycystic ovarian syndrome there are lots of legitimate reasons where women don't menstruate oh not and, to mention postmenopausal women as well our grandmothers yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there are also lots of men who menstruate. Trans men, a a lot of people don't understand how transition works, but it is very common um, for trans men either to menstruate continuously while on testosterone or to have issues with hormone levels where it comes back for a period of time. I have like three trans men that I'm working with right now that like this is currently an issue that they are going to doctors about and they're like, not quite sure what happened with their levels or if their prescription needs to be changed or something in life, but like their period just returned. Like this is, this is just incorrect. And also a lot of cis women don't view that as helpful. Like when you just say women who meant like womanhood is about menstruation. We have a lot of historical issues with like women who experience infertility, not being included in womanhood. And so she is saying that she wants to be like supported in her womanhood, but she's not even including all women in that because there are mm-hmm. lots of cis women who would probably feel better with the uh, like opinion article titled as it was because it doesn't call into question their womanhood for not bleeding. It also just mm-hmm. feels like a strange hill to die on to say that womanhood is defined by menstruation. <laughs> um, yeah. Because anyone who's ever experienced menstruation knows that it's not something that is societally celebrated. Yeah, no. you don't love it, right? It's not like a party. It also it's it's also medically damaging. Like endometriosis is a huge issue um that a lot more women face than we have diagnosed that they are facing. And a lot of times women will go to the ER or go schedule doctor appointments to discuss endometriosis symptoms and will be told that they are exaggerating or they're being hysterical or that this isn't what's happening. And so this is like, no one's paying attention to this anyway. (laughs) She, in her statement, she moves on to say, accusations of turfery have been sufficient to intimidate many people, institutions, and organizations I once admired who are cowering before the tactics of the playground. What's next? They'll say you've got fleas? Speaking as a biological woman, a lot of people in positions of power really need to grow a pair, which is doubtless literally possible, according to the kind of people who argue that clownfish prove humans aren't, I don't know that word. Dimorphic? Uh, Dimorphic, yeah. Okay. (laughs) Aren't dimorphic species. This is where, I think, Andrew, you mentioned it earlier. She tries to get a little cute. She tries to be funny. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't. It does just resonate. <laughs> like, I, it, honestly, for me, I read that and I was just completely confused. I, I my I brain didn't... shorted out here. Too. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think she's trying to confuse us. <laughs> she, so she, Andrew, you're, you're you're mostly right that she is trying to confuse you. She is. It is mind boggling how many wrong things were said. Um, I don't know if any of you watched Shit's Creek, but I've never heard mm-hmm. some, someone say so many wrong things in a row consecutively. <laughs> First of all, um, we've already discussed biological woman and that not being an affirmative term. So what she means is being cisgender, which is what the word that we use if you were assigned female at birth and identify as a woman. Um, She's continuing to, again, use a logical fallacy. Like this is a slippery slope argument. And she is using this to make trans affirmation look moronic for people who do not understand what trans affirmation actually is. And so she is being very deliberate in talking about clownfish and saying that we think that you can literally grow a pair. No, no one, no one says, no one says any of that. And this is another place that for people who understand 
more about trans activism and also turf spaces, she is using a lot of turf language. Some of the examples, we're not going to talk about all of them like in quotes, but you can kind of look through the statement um, if you feel you must. Uh, so gender critical women is a very turf term um, discussing the category, like the gender as women, men and trans people discussing natal girls, discussing rapid onset gender dysphoria. Those are terms you only see if you are in TERF Twitter or on TERF spaces. And so those are other reasons that we know that the sources that she's supposedly reading are not legitimate. Like, mm-hmm. these are not terms that are scholarly. These are terms that are almost exclusively used in transphobic spaces and publications and blogs. And they yeah. run up against science. So if you don't yes. want to be called a TERF, don't use turf language out of the turf dictionary it's kind of that simple so now let's move on to the buzzfeed portion of the article she laid out the top five reasons why she's speaking out (laughs) (laughs) this article is all over the place it really is (laughs) there's a listicle in here I, i know that there's been a lot of troubling things that have already been said but i think it gets even more so as we move into this top five because there's so many things that are conflated together that really ha- understand for her there's connections, but the, the conclusions that she ultimately draws, I think, are, are a little bit discomforting. Yeah. And she calls this the new trans activism, but Sarah, <laughs> you take issue with that, right? Yeah, um, this isn't new. Um, I mean, if we are seeing now with a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of intersectionality with that, people are becoming very well acquainted that Stonewall was started by Black trans women. This has always been the case. Trans women and trans men and trans issues are intertwined with a lot of queer history. And um, to this point, one of the um, likes, the like incidents that she had um, actually shows you even more how like exclusionary and transphobic her beliefs are because she publicly acknowledged through liking the tweet, a uh, gay activist. Um, whose name is Fred Sargent, who was a veteran of the Stonewall riots and a first pride organizer and early contributor to the first draft of the gay agenda, according to his Twitter bio. And he is a fierce advocate of exclusion of transgender people from the LGBTQ community. And he says, it's time to remove T from same-sex advocacy group. Trans has nothing to do with us and we owe them nothing. So I'm just going to leave that there for you. Let's take a look here at at the five reasons why she's speaking out. Uh, The first is related to her charitable trust, which is focused on alleviating social deprivation with an emphasis on both women and children. She says, among other things, my trust supports projects for female prisoners and for survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. I also fund medical research into MS, a disease that behaves very differently in men and women. It's been clear to me for a while that the new trans activism is having or is likely to have, if all its demands are met, a significant impact on many of the causes I support because it's pushing to erode the legal definition of sex and replace it with gender. And we felt this was a good time to talk about what the proposed changes to the Scottish Gender Recognition Act would look like, um, because after you read this, it makes me wonder what she's talking about. In the the preamble to these recommendations, um, it says the Scottish government's proposals to reform the 2004 Act will not make any changes to the Equality Act of 2010. This means that single-sex services are protected as are single-sex employment rights and health services. According to this... Scotland is not looking to make the kinds of changes that she claims the trans community is trying to push for. Mm. Um, Additionally, wanted to point out that the reason that Scotland is looking to 
update its Gender Recognition Act is because the World Health Organization has actually updated its definition of gender identity. Um, so according to the, wor- the World Health Organization, gender identity disorders are no longer listed in the mental and behavioral disorders chapter and are now in the new conditions related to sexual health chapter. So this is twofold. Um, Scotland is looking to take down some of the barriers that in the past made it more difficult for people to have their gender recognized. But at the same time, they're also working to be compliant with the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. This this would have been a perfect opportunity for her, though. Uh, We talked about it earlier in the the episode to include a link to provide people with a reference point for this gender recognition bill in Scotland. Because without having this available to us, without you know, one of our listeners sending it in, I don't think we would have the same context. Yeah, we're going to take her word for it. She wants us to take her word for it. And even though I read this for the first time and I was like, oh, she's really concerned. I did get the sense that there was some kind of boogeyman in the background of all of her writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was one point where she discussed a certificate. And I remember reading that and being like, what is she talking about? Like, what certificate is this? And what does she think she's talking about? Like, what's going on? And I didn't know that this was happening. I mean, there are always policy changes happening, trying to limit trans health care everywhere. And so I should have assumed that there was something happening. But uh, the certificate that she talks about later is directly from this proposed act. And it made it abundantly clear to me. And I then reread the statement through that lens. And a lot of the language that she uses is like, this is essentially, she is like on, like trying to talk to politicians, trying to lobby for her side of this. And we were just thrown along for the ride without our consent. (laughs) Or just without any context or, or knowledge as to what this is all about. But mm-hmm. yeah. the next reason that she gave is that she is an ex-teacher and a founder of a children's charity. So another charitable foundation position coming from J.K. Rowling here, giving her an interest in education and safeguarding. Huh, here we go. Safeguarding it's all about, against what? Yeah, it's it's all yeah. about not teaching our kids that they can be who they say they are, right? It's all about teaching our kids to to be the children that we want them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many things like this that are written about marginalized folk pretend that those people don't exist and that they aren't reading this right now. Like when you are a teacher, you are teaching some people who are cisgender and some people who are trans. Mm -hmm. So who who are we safeguarding? Yeah. Sounds more like gatekeeping. Mm. Uh, Point three, freedom of speech. Yeah, so this was an interesting one. Um, And we've actually gotten some commentary from a few folks um, pointing out, like, we can't attack J.K. Rowling's right to free speech. Um, I would just observe, and I mean, I'm speaking from a purely American perspective. Um, We have some documentation here about what free speech looks like in the UK. Um, But freedom of speech, just as a rule does not mean freedom from consequences, does not mean freedom (laughs) from other people's speech. Um, So just as J.K. Rowling can say whatever she wants, um, we are allowed to respond how we want. Yeah. A lot of people seem to be conveniently forgetting that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a really common thing that happens in this country where people like to lean on freedom of speech um, and they forget that, you know, the First Amendment <laughs> protects you from the government, not from private citizens or businesses. So when you put something out into the universe, you have the right to do that as long as it's not, you know, at least in this country, as long as it's not something like yelling fire in a crowded room, for example. Um, You know, people have every right to respond to that with their own free speech. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Yeah, this third reason is two sentences long, and she mentions Donald Trump. Yeah. That's one of the one of the few names she drops in this uh, paper. Is that Donald Trump? I'm interested in freedom of speech and have publicly defended it even unto Donald Trump. Okay, thanks, Joe. 
Also, just wanted to point out this could be there could be a different classification of this in the UK. You know, none of us here are experts on um, free speech in the UK and what exactly it means and like the legalities behind this. But we did want to include this. Um, the exercise of these freedoms, since it carries with it duties and responsibilities, may be subject to such formalities, conditions, restrictions, or penalties as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society. Public safety for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, for the protection of the reputation of rights of others. Um, So that is from the Human Rights Act of 1998. All right, let's move on to this fourth point. This is a big one. Concern about the numbers of people who are detransitioning. So in other words, these people are deciding to transition, in J.K. Rowling's opinion, sometimes too early, and then they change their minds. And according to her, studies have consistently shown that between 60 to 90 percent of gender dysphoric teens will grow out of their dysphoria. Sarah, fact or fiction? (laughs) This is wild. No, no, no. Yeah, this is this is absolutely incorrect. So here's some of the things that we do know about um, how gender dysphoria works. And I want to be very clear with this. We don't have many studies directly researching this. And part of that is, again, because this is a marginalized group and a lot of um, research is done through grants. And this is not always grant funded research. But also in order to understand this, like methodologically, you would need to do like longitudinal studies. And we have not. And so this number, these numbers are crazy. But what we do know is that there was a study done in 1993, which seems like a long time ago, but scholarly, it's not actually considered that long ago um, in terms of kind of uh, this research. And so regrets about transitioning were extremely rare. They found that 1% to 1.5% of male to female uh, trans women um, and under 1% of trans men, so female to male, regretted transitioning. And further, um, there was a 2012 trans mental health study, which found when we talk about regrets and trans people say that they have regrets, most of the time they are regretting not transitioning sooner, wanting to use a different surgeon, having a complication from surgery, having a, a work issue arise from coming out. Like they are not discussing that they don't want to transition or they regret transitioning in general. And so... This is just absolutely false, what she is throwing out. This 1993 study says 1 to 1.5%. That is not 60 to 90% of people. And also, if you send 60 to again, if you're, if I'm just, I just keep pretending if this was a peer reviewed journal because it makes me laugh every time. Like, that would be like so hard. They would just be like, this is not like, what how do you get such a crazy number 60 to 90 is such a range like this isn't That's a anything. big range yeah this yeah. is gonna be published because <laughs> on, on one end you're almost saying 100 percent of the people yeah and, and that's, then that's yeah. it's insane and i also <laughs> yeah. wanted to point out just from the political side of things um just given the fact that it it seems likely that this is where at least part of her concerns lie. Um, according to the Gender Recognition Act in Scotland, um, the Act of 2004, nobody under the age of 18 can apply for legal gender recognition. Um, the sort of proposed changes to the act say um, that they may consider lowering that age to 16. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're going to seek views about doing that. But certainly, even if this proposal were to be accepted, nobody under the age of 16 would be able to do this. Currently, the age is 18. So it makes me wonder where she's getting this concern about, you know, gender dysphoric children and teens being able to apply for legal gender recognition too early because it doesn't seem that the law would allow for it. Yeah. And and we'll discuss, I, I have points to discuss this a bit later as we kind of get more into uh, quotes that she says that touch more on this, but a lot of gender affirmation procedures and options are done on an informed consent basis, which means you are an adult, you are an autonomous person with agency over your own body. It is my job as 
the healthcare professional to explain to you what you are engaging in. And then that is it. Like, it is not my job to tell you whether or not you are or not trans. You will or will not regret this. And lots of adults do things that they regret sometimes. So like, yes, some people do detransition. That is not, that is not a zero. Um, and so that is life. Like people regret tattoos. People regret other surgeries. People regret marriages. Like sometimes you regret something. Right. But she's so flippant with this. She says, oh, so many people are detransitioning as if these people did not put a lot of thought into this. And we referenced this earlier. She said that teen girls just get together on a Friday night and instead of braiding each other's hair and playing board games or whatever they're doing, gossiping about boys, they all get together and they say, you know what? Let's all change our gender. Mm -hmm. In what world does that happen? Certainly not on this planet. And I find it so offensive that she would just be so flippant with that kind of idea. And also reminds me of, of this passage a little later, where she says, I can't help but wonder if I'd been born 30 years later, I too might have tried to transition. J.K. Rowling, this is not a light decision that people take. They don't make yeah, it to it avoid physical abuse. They're making it because they feel deep within them that they are not the biological sex that they were born with. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, from the mental health point of view, and again, this is, uh, this is as an American experience. And so it is different in the UK. Some of it is more streamlined that makes it, um, in a lot of ways harder to get a hold of like getting, um, I guess registered is not the right word that they would use, but getting involved with a gender clinic is, um, makes it so that way your procedures are covered, but it also can be a huge wait list. Um, and so as an American and working in healthcare, this is like, you have to do a lot of work and what we are fighting for and what JK Rowling is on. I, I think unintentionally fighting against is we are not trying to necessarily make it like quote unquote easier just for the sake of making it easier, but it's tied to knowledge. It's tied to research. What is happening now because we are having all these policy limitations on trans affirmative care is it allows professionals to not be knowledgeable of what gender dysphoria looks like, how to treat it and how it presents. And that is what is killing people. And so when you are working in mental health for trans people, there is a standard, an ethical standard that we are supposed to follow called the WPATH Standards of Care. WPATH is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Um, it's available for free online. So you can look it up. It's like a 120 page PDF, but it has a pretty good um, table of contents. So you can like look around, but there are discussions like this is what healthcare professionals or therapists in this case are supposed to help you with is explaining how to kind of work through the systems of oppression to know what's going on. And I have worked with several clients that have thought they were trans and realized it was something else. And it's something that I introduce readily to them that you can understand that there, you can be questioning, you can know that there's something, something up. But there's a lack of language. There's a lack of research. And because of that, you cannot exactly know what, what is happening or what you want to do, especially because we have this in such binary terms. And so sometimes what that looks like is someone comes in and they believe that they are a trans guy and that they, you know, need to like do all of medical transition, like become complete, quote unquote, a lot of people will use that language. And then they'll realize that like, oh, no, like I, I want testosterone. Yes, I want top surgery. Yes, but like, I don't need bottom surgery, or I don't need to change my name. I don't need to change my gender marker here. As I discuss this with clients, like it's as if you're entering a buffet, and you have a choice of what things you choose at that buffet. And if JK Rowling was in therapy, you know, also, you don't, it doesn't need to be 30 years later, like trans people existed 30 years ago. Um, you just needed to find someone who was informed on this. And right now, because of the policy limitations, people are not informed. And it is making it harder for trans people to find 
educated providers for them to explain what's going on, to help them see what's going on. And also just like medically to still do the tests that they need. There are lots of times that trans people will go into like the, like a medical office or the ER and like request something like, again, a hysterectomy or um, a prostate exam. And they will be denied that because they will believe that they don't, do not need that. And like that kind of flippant response is what we're fighting against here and what we're hoping to alleviate by educating people further. Let's complete her um, listicle here, though. Point five was that she shared her personal experiences with domestic abuse and sexual assault. And of course, that is absolutely awful. Uh, We are so sorry to hear that. She notes that this is the first time she's speaking so openly about this. She also got permission from her daughter to share her story. Um, But she says this is one of the reasons why she felt the need to speak out. Yeah, here's a quote that uh, she sounds really understanding of the situation at large. She says, I believe the majority of trans identified people not only pose zero threat to others, but are vulnerable for all the reasons I've outlined. Trans people need and deserve protection. Like women, they're most likely to be killed by sexual partners. Trans women who work in the sex industry, particularly trans women of color, are at particular risk. Like every other domestic abuse and sexual assault survivor I know, I feel nothing but empathy and solidarity with trans women who've been abused by men, so I want trans women to be safe. At the same time, I do not want to make natal girls and women less safe. When you throw open the doors of bathrooms and changing rooms to any man who believes or feels he's a woman, as I've said, gender confirmation certificates may now be granted without any need for surgery or hormones, then you open the door to any and all men who wish to come inside. That's the simple truth. Sarah, is that the simple truth? No. (laughs) (laughs) She's seeming so understanding. That whole thing about how trans women are so at risk, it seems to like it. She's. Doing my head in here. The the bathroom argument is so darn stupid, and this has come up in America multiple times as well. The bathrooms for women and men, public restrooms, are unlocked. Guys can get in there and be total you-know-what, um, awful people, if they really want to. They do not need to transition in order to do that. I think this bathroom argument is just so stupid, and it gets brought up so often A bathroom door with a women's sign on it is not going to stop men from being predators. Don't we also think that trans women are more at risk if they use a men's room? If they've transitioned? I mean, so this is something that lots of trans people will like consciously think about before they leave their house is like how long they're going to be gone, whether or not they're going to need to use a restroom while they're gone, how close they're going to be to home. Because the bathroom debates that are happening Make it unsafe for trans women to use the men or women's restroom. Also make it unsafe for trans men to use the men or women's restroom. There are lots of times, like the the abuse that happens is to trans people where some person is trying to police them. And Mm -hmm. like they're, I mean, it, it is scary. Like think about how scary that would be if you are just trying to use the restroom, especially if like you really need to use the restroom and then you are just being yelled at or the manager is being called on you, or the police are being called on you. And mm-hmm. that is what happens to a lot of trans people. And I mean, in her fifth point, and I know that there's been a lot of things that have happened kind of since then about J.K. Rowling's history of abuse and discussing it, um, in terms of like, I think The Sun is the which, publication which, that- Which I'm going to come right out and condemn that. That that was the yeah. worst display of anything. And, 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 and it's very easy- to say that that is the absolute worst thing that could have come from this, uh, yeah. the tabloid. None it of us it was, no, that was appalling. But it becomes clear, and quite honestly, like, I think J.K. Rowling is proving through this piece, she really needs therapy. Like, this is something that she she kind of very casually, and again, tries to make a joke of, you know, it's a it's a common family running gag, like, my jumpiness. Like that is PTSD and like, I'm not diagnosing Mm -hmm. her, but I'm saying that like, there are a lot of things that she wrote that like are upsetting and I hope that she gets help for it. And she discusses, you know, at different places. So she discusses this abuse and she discusses like her coming to terms with like femininity for herself. You know, as Harry Potter fans, I just want to say like, 
I've been rereading or the Phoenix, like, uh, with a reading group during quarantine and in that book in particular, but through all the books, she shows a lot of internalized misogyny. Like there are a lot of issues with how she presents femininity and she reserves her comments about femininity for villains. She talks about it for Umbridge, she talks about it for like poverty and lavender. Like she, she needs to work through this. And I hope that she works through this and she finds some professional help. Well, and let's not forget how she deals with Umbridge, how the kids are so uh, relieved uh, Umbridge from the school is by savage violence um, against Umbridge. Like that's definitely ringing some, some bells. Something that I would just like to bring up again um, from the Scottish Gender Recognition Act, currently um, applicants must live, and this is from the act itself, this is the language from it, applicants must have lived in their acquired gender for a minimum of two years currently in Scotland Mm. before they can apply for a gender recognition certificate. Um, Mm. The proposed change to the act would reduce that period to three months um, after which they can apply for the certificate. And after their application is accepted, they would have to go through a three-month reflection period before proceeding. Um, so the way that she's presenting this argument, it's as though once somebody has that gender recognition certificate, they can go into any bathroom they want, as though somebody who has the aim to assault somebody would go through a six-month period to get their certificate and then show up at the bathroom being like, I have my certificate now. No, of that's, course not. That, that's not There's how just no any evidence. of this works. There's just no <laughs> evidence of this occurring. Well, and the other thing is, think about these men who would want to do that. Do you think they would want to be trans people? No. So they, they wouldn't take that on either. Somebody who's transitioning doesn't want to go through the burden of, of being judged and mistreated for this either. A lot of this just reminds me of the gay rights movement. You know, Mm -hmm. LGBT, we're all looped together because this is not a choice. And we don't want to go through the the pain and the hurt and the prejudice that comes along with coming out. And for Mm -hmm. J.K. Rowling to act like this is an easy process is just really offensive. Yeah. And it's really like, I don't want to get into the weeds of it, but it is really not easy. And it is expensive it is time consuming it is stressful it's not an easy process as it is and so trying to make it harder is inhumane one of the things that that stood out to me too was when she says again and again i've been told to just meet some trans people it it, and she's and then she goes into well i have and dot 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 but it just reminds me of when people will always say oh well just meet a few gay people, meet a few black people, meet a few Jewish people, and and like somehow that solves the problem. You, it's not just a matter of meeting. You have to listen. You have to have conversation. You have to get, you know, that's the only way that you're going to get a better understanding of what is going on. Yeah, and I, I, she's I, not I, listening. That's the problem. It's, it was especially clear, you know, she ends all of this by discussing at, that she's asking for empathy. And that to be extended to her and the millions of women. And many people have tried to be empathetic to her and open up dialogues. And she has blocked them on Twitter. She closed replies to this post. Like this is not, Mm -hmm. her request is being granted and she is actively avoiding it and actively shutting it down. And so that's not what she's asking. Not to mention the number of LGBT affirming groups that have reached out and offered to have closed door conversations with her. Um, yeah. She has denied those offers. Yeah, she doesn't want to hear it. The last point, Sarah, you wanted to bring up. As we talked about already, she didn't cite like almost any sources, um, but there was one that she did. And so she discussed uh, Lisa Lippman. And I'm not going to get like too into it. Um, I actually did. Um, I think it'll be in the show notes. I wrote a piece um, discussing kind of scholarly what's going on in her statement. Um, but briefly, Lisa Lippman um, wrote a paper again in 2018. And then it was taken down and republished because of some concerns methodologically and through expertise, um, like expert reviewers coming in again um, of what she was discussing but she 
started, um, she hypothesized the idea of rapid onset gender dysphoria, which, um, as I discussed, has kind of taken off like wildfire in a lot of turf spaces. And so what rapid onset gender dysphoria essentially is, is that like teenagers are getting together and they're all transitioning. And so it's that trans trender that we might've heard before. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, this transition party, Saturday night with the girls. Let's do it. Scientifically, like, this is not something, I mean, as a scholar, I don't think it's going to take off very much. Like, there are a lot of methodological concerns. But the the purpose of the study in and of itself was not to test anything. Like, this was exploratory. And within scholarship, exploratory research is to come up with ideas for other scholars to test and to see if the hypothesis is accurate and if it kind of stands up to rigor. And so the fact that TERFs are using this as like key elements to make grand sweeping statements shows a lack of understanding of how science works and a lack of understanding of what Lisa was trying to do in this publication. Um, and there's also like, she just has another point where she talks about um, like a psychiatrist, I believe in his resignation letter, which weird thing to quote is someone's resignation letter. But she also goes back and forth several times, which is also how you can tell that she doesn't really have a point to make. Like she isn't clear in what she's talking about. And so some of the things that she does, she discusses early on that in the UK, they have seen, a 4,400% increase in trans men, which is a wild number. I want to know where she got that. So essentially what that means is that this this is a concern mostly of trans men. And -hmm. then she spends this entire manifesto discussing trans women. Mm -hmm. And then she goes on to say that she believes that the majority of trans people are not a threat and that they are also vulnerable and deserve protection. And so just like doing some quick math here, I don't know how many numbers she is talking about. Like what she keeps making these like grand uh, accusations. But when she gets down into it, she is making it clear that she knows that she's not talking about very many, if any at all. And so just pay attention to that as well, because that's something that is used in a lot of transphobic arguments. Trans women are more often they're at risk for hate crimes just this week we have had two trans people of color killed in 24 hours um brutally killed one of them was dismembered and like that also wasn't news until like four days later think about like how wild that is someone was dismembered and that wasn't news for days and so oftentimes when we discuss transphobia we are discussing trans women as threats and we are trying to ignore trans men as existing in this. And yeah. she is falling into that even after explicitly stating a 4,400% increase in trans men in the UK. As you're saying, she's all over the place. And I've been thinking in the back of my head about her her timing. It almost seems like she rushed out this blog post. I mean, she made those tweets Saturday night. She published this Wednesday morning. And this is over 3,000 words, like we've said. There's a lot of information in here. Part of me wonders if she'd been kind of writing this in her head since December, so maybe she was able to punch it out quick. But it does seem like she should have taken more time to research all this, maybe provide a few more links, and maybe think this through, because as you're saying, it is all over the place. Well, and also, I think that when you are voicing something that you think is a problem, the onus is on you to provide a solution. Um, I, there's nothing more annoying to me than when people come to the table to complain about something and then they have no proposal as to how they think it could be, you know, more better addressed. Um, so she's saying, you know, the majority of trans people are not a threat and they're also vulnerable and deserve protection. Okay. If not legal gender recognition by the government, then what, what protection are you talking about? There was an element, I think you guys discussed on Millennial, about whether or not J.K. Rowling is salvageable, whether her views could be changed. Do we want to touch on that at all? I don't think her views can be changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she makes it very clear in this letter that she is not going to back down. I mean, she literally says that. She's at a point in her life, in her career, where she is very successful. She does not need to change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why bother? Why bother? 
and by turning down closed door conversations, I mean, this is willful ignorance at this part. She cannot claim that she just hasn't had the opportunity. And something that I discuss um, with a lot of people when they're, they're having these kind of conversations of activism and of social justice is really recognizing whether or not someone's teachable and whether or not you should try to teach them. And she is, she is holding up every sign saying that she ain't listening. Like she is not teachable. I'm glad you brought that up because I asked my therapist about this. I was bothered by JK Rowling's thing. And he said that, well, it seems that this exclusion that JK Rowling is perpetuating seems to be fear-based, right? She's telling us that mm-hmm. she's afraid of what's happening to women in bathrooms. Mm-hmm. She's afraid. And he, and my therapist, to his credit, said that's actually a little bit more approachable or more solvable than if JK Rowling were approaching this from a position of like nihilism or hate based mm-hmm. exclusion, which is fear plus the certainty that it's right to exclude these people. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think your therapist is wrong. So that, that goes again back into, I think there is a, there is a very clear cry for help in this manifesto. And in order, like in order to change, she needs to do some work on herself and she needs to work through clearly some really deep trauma that she is coming to light with and that she's probably been sitting with and wrestling with internally for a while. And until and unless she does that work in her own therapy, no one is going to teach her. Like this fear is is based in her needing to work through her own mental health. It's clear that there's this deep personal struggle that's going on kind of within JK Rowling. Is there any validity to some of her concerns? Because I think people who are listening to the show are going to ask that question, who are going to read the letter or go on social media. Is there anything that can be taken away from what she's saying that is actually valid? (sighs) I mean, I'm sure she wrote a lot of words. And so probably a little, but like not whole points. Like she, she never makes a full statement that is correct. And so she has glimmers of other arguments or other things that she could suppose. And so, for example, one thing that is potentially an idea that can flourish is the idea of like the lived experience of being socialized as female and like that being a reality. And so having safe spaces, having women only spaces, but that is not something that is as she is wording it because like i i have to convince trans women that i work with that they are allowed to go into all women's spaces like they know they know that you don't want them there and so trans people are notorious in many ways to be catering to cis feelings and they do that sometimes unintentionally i believe just again because of internalized transphobia and how the world is operating but also because of like fear like they are so at risk of violence they are so disproportionately at risk for hate crimes that they are very observant of their surroundings and so they do not approach things if it is going to be harmful to them and so yes like there is some need sometimes i can see for there to be spaces for people who are socialized as female to be able to get together but there are also ways around that that aren't like just ignoring trans people or saying that trans people are taking up too much space. It is, we don't socialize our children in a gendered way. (laughs) Like if we, again, worked with feminism and tried to tackle the like system of the patriarchy, we wouldn't need those safe spaces in those ways. Yeah. The, the second part of that question was, we talked a lot about rushing to judgment at the top of the show. A lot of people think that that's what we're doing, but in terms of flipping to the other side of of the coin and and people who will just go and say, hashtag I stand with JKR, right? We've gotten emails about that. We've seen tweets about that. What does that mean? Like what should, and why should people be careful about just jumping to that conclusion? Yeah. When you, when you say that you stand with JKR, again, if you are supporting this opinion, what does that actually mean? Like, what it means is... It's not is, supporting Harry Potter. 
yeah, it's not supporting Harry Potter, but it also means that like this, this is becomes a louder voice. It becomes more of a political voice and it leads to this, you know, gender act thing that we're seeing in the UK. It leads to what we are now seeing in the U S it leads to discrimination in mental health care and in medical spaces. Like it has ripple effects. And so I think that it's important for people to understand the consequences of opinions. And like Laura said at the beginning, like, yeah, we have freedom of speech and you're allowed to have opinions, but that doesn't mean that you are allowed to shout like fire in a crowded theater. It doesn't mean that you are free from like people criticizing your opinions. And the reason why people are so quick and experts are also so quick, people who work in these spaces are so quick to shut this down is because they have huge lasting impacts. The bills that we are setting place will last for generations. Like these are fights that will kill people and have killed people. And you cannot deny those facts. And so, you know, we can all have different emotions with JK Rowling. We obviously have connections to Harry Potter when it comes down to it. And I'm saying this as a huge Harry Potter fan, Harry Potter is a story and it is something that we enjoy. My interest in it will never override people's livelihoods and people's safety. And that is what JK Rowling is doing now. Sarah, while we still have you here and I made the, uh, we have the perk of, I guess, listening to some comments or responding to some comments that we got live. My final question for you really is just why is it important that women and so-called natal girls um, do not fear trans women? Trans women are doing exactly what we think cis women are. Like when we frame the arguments of cis women should be allowed to exist in the world without threat of violence from men with being allowed to you know walk alone at night not put your keys between your fingers ready to attack someone if they're coming to you that is what trans women are also experiencing and that's why y'all have the same fight and trans women as i said before are so at risk and are so persecuted a lot of the time, you know, it is very real that this threat of violence is happening against cis women. And like, no one is denouncing that. No one is saying that that isn't happening. Like that is happening, but that is happening, you know, astronomically more often to trans women. This year, we've already seen well, the number's higher now. When I was on Millennial, I said 12 trans people. I think we're now at 15 trans people that were killed in 2020. Half of which, I should remind people, we were supposed to be staying in our houses. And last year, there, I think, were 26 trans women or trans people that were killed and 21 were trans women. And so this is a disproportionate issue um, to trans women. And it is keeping them safe and they are not, they are not violent. They are not a threat to you. They are seeking the same solace and protection that JK Rowling is hoping to give cis women. So one final thing before we discuss what we're going to be doing going forward, WB issued a statement and this was the worst statement of all, but this is what happens when Warner Brothers still has three movies, maybe a TV series, maybe other movies in the pipeline with JK Rowling. They don't want to piss her off. So they issued their statement, and it says, The events in the last several weeks have firmed our resolve as a company to confront difficult societal issues. Warner Brothers' position on inclusiveness is well established, and fostering a diverse and inclusive culture has never been more important to our company and to our audiences around the world. We deeply value the work of our storytellers who give so much of themselves in sharing their creations with us all. We recognize our responsibility to foster empathy and advocate understanding of all communities and all people, particularly those we work with and those we reach through our content. So they don't address J.K. Rowling. They don't <laughs> say anything. They don't take a position. Well, well, in all honesty, I mean, this could easily have been a statement that they released around recent events that have been going on in our country. They just yeah, changed it could a couple be of words. 
<laughs> give me anything. But this I'll is what, honest. as I tweeted, this is what it looks like when you don't want to piss off the woman who is responsible for an obscene amount of your profits. Mm-hmm. They can't lose her. They need her. So, but they had to say something. It's just a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> something else I just wanted to plug before we move on to sort of what MuggleCast is going to look like in the future. Um, Thanks again to Anna for sending this in. For Scottish listeners who want to support the Gender Recognition Act, you can head over to lgbtyouth.org.uk to find an email template and a list of your members of Scottish Parliament to contact in support of the act. So um, what are we going to do going forward? And we're bringing this up because a lot of people, like I said, have been very hurt by J.K. Rowling's comments and they feel they are done with her. MuggleCast has always been an escape for people, just like Harry Potter has been, and we would never want to end the show. We want to continue providing an escape for people. We genuinely enjoy doing this, working together, talking about Harry Potter and the lessons and all the intricacies of the series. So... That said, we are going to be making a few changes because we don't feel like we can support J.K. Rowling in the way that we have before. And we've heard from some people who have said, you guys are actually too late on this. You should have started treating her differently sooner. And to those people, I say now I think you're right. I don't think we were thinking as clearly as uh, we should have been months ago or even years ago, because there have been a lot of problematic stances uh, from J.K. Rowling in the past couple of years. And also... People are looking at her books again and, 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 and thinking back to some problematic views, which maybe we can address at another time. We've also heard from people who said that we should be eternally grateful and, you know, we give are all praise to J.K. Rowling. And we are uh, 100%. But we don't need to suck up to her every time we criticize her. That's exactly. the crazy part. Some people are like, I haven't heard a thank you out of you while criticizing J.K. Rowling. We need to do that every time? No, we don't. I mean, it's 2020. We all have problematic faves. We're all learning how all these these things that we love were created by people to varying degrees of disappointment to us. And like, I think loving a thing, it does not ever have to mean just like ignoring parts of it that are wrong. Like to love something is to treat it seriously and critically. And there are lots of spaces. I mean, when I first fell in love with MuggleCast, like that was one of the reasons. Like I loved how much this show treated this work like it mattered. And if we're going to treat it like it matters, I think that that also means that we have to discuss some of these things that we might not like and that might not be the most positive light shown on it. So here are a few of the changes that we're going to be making. First of all, we are no longer going to be speaking about J.K. Rowling's projects outside of the Wizarding World. We don't feel comfortable promoting her forthcoming work. That includes Corman Strike, the Ichabog, and whatever else she may create. Um, we are also no longer going to talk about what J.K. Rowling is saying on Twitter. If she's hurting fans again, uh, we might bring it up. But like I said at the top of the show, this is the last time we're going to be discussing um, what she has to say on this issue in particular in such detail, because we know now it is abundantly clear where she stands, and we don't need to keep talking in circles about why we feel she's wrong. Uh, but this also is applied to everything else that she says on Twitter. It's just we, we, we don't need to talk about it anymore. But we are a Harry Potter podcast, and we will continue to cover Wizarding World-related announcements and continue to review various elements. I'm thinking video games. I'm thinking theme park. But we're going to avoid discussing JKR's involvement in it, if any. And by that, I mean we will clarify whether or not something is um, canon or not, because that's important. But we're not going to be talking about it in a way that praises J.K. Rowling. And then finally, we're going to strive to highlight fan initiatives more and talk more about the fandom. The fandom is what has made Harry Potter so great. J.K. Rowling wrote the stories, but then we all met each other. We all started hanging out together. We celebrated Harry Potter together. J.K. Rowling did not create the fandom. We did. So we're going to be focusing more on fan creations and the fandom and, and the people who have made this community so, so great. So those are some of the changes we're going to be making. There might be more adjustments in the future. And then the final point I'll bring up here is that we are going to 
we have made a donation to Trans Lifeline. Uh, this was brought up earlier. You can find them at translifeline.org. This is a trans-led organization that connects trans people to the community, support, and resources that they need to survive and thrive. And this is something right now that is so important as they face backlash from people like J.K. Rowling, from um, people in the U.S. government. So we've made a $700 donation to them, and we encourage you to uh, donate if you can. And again, that's translifeline.org. Dan Radcliffe's response, or part of his response, uh, ties really nicely and, and really echoes our sentiments as a podcast. He said, to all the people who now feel their experience of the books has been tarnished or diminished, I am deeply sorry for the pain these comments have caused you. I really hope that you don't entirely lose what was valuable in these stories to you. If these books taught you that love is the strongest force in the universe, capable of overcoming anything, if they taught you that strength is found in diversity and that dogmatic ideas of pureness lead to the oppression of vulnerable groups, if you believe that a particular character is trans, non-binary, or gender fluid, or that they are gay or bisexual, if you found anything in these stories that resonated with you and helped you at any time in your life, then that is between you and the book that you read and it is sacred. And in my opinion, nobody can touch that. It means to you what it means to you. And I hope that these comments will not taint that too much. With that in mind, as we close out here, I thought that we could just touch on the idea that it's okay to feel lots of different emotions surrounding this. I feel like when you look at the internet, you know, you're seeing like the far ends of reactions and the interp it could be very easy to walk away from this with the interpretation that, you know, people now, you know, people who disagree with JK Rowling hate her and want to burn her books. And the people who agree with her are just accepting everything that she says at face value. I don't think that those encapsulate the entirety of the emotional response to this. Mm -hmm. I know for me personally, it's been uh, this ball of emotions um, that have just been like building inside of me for the last few days. And it's like disappointment and resentment and a little bit of guilt and just like a whole bunch of stuff. And that's okay. It's important to talk about it. And it's important to, that we sit with this and, and we, we really think about this critically as we move forward, analyzing the books that we care so much about. Yeah, I, I want to briefly say, because I, I do have to hop off in a couple minutes. And so I've been seeing a lot of things on Twitter about how she raised us to fight against her now. And that is very true. And a lot of work, a lot of work in educating yourself, a lot of work in allyship is sitting in discomfort and making yourself understand the complexity of situations. It doesn't have to come easy. A lot of this shouldn't come easy. And I feel like for myself, you know, Harry Potter, a, a lot of a lot of the hosts here can say they knew me when I was young and they knew me just as the Harry Potter fan. And Harry Potter shaped a lot of my goals. It shaped a lot of my scholarship. I talk about quotes in my practice. I think I even have some Harry Potter artwork in my office. I know that I have a ton of it in my house. Like this is something that is still greatly a part of my life. And it is greatly a part of my life because it taught lessons that apparently J.K. Rowling didn't necessarily mean to teach or meant it at the time and then forgot she meant it. I don't quite know what it is, but we have to make the choice between what is right and what is easy right now. And what is easy is to simplify that Harry Potter is J.K. Rowling and J.K. Rowling has to be good because Harry Potter is good. And what is right is recognizing we love Harry Potter because it's a deep story. It's a complex story. It roots for the underdog. It says that we can fight for what is right and fight against oppressive systems that are trying to intentionally hurt people. In the series, we see how it is hurting Muggleborns. It is hurting other like magical beasts. And in the real world, it is hurting marginalized folk. It is hurting people of color. It is hurting trans people. It is hurting queer people. And I know that it is my love for Harry Potter and my continued love for Harry Potter that is making me 
say this and that is making me know that JK Rowling is wrong. And I can say, I can hold both thoughts in my head that JK Rowling is wrong and that Harry Potter is still good. And Harry Potter is still something that is worth exploring and seeing the lessons within it. I have never been so sure of a clip to use on social media. (laughs) Dr. Sarah Steelman, thank you so much. You are a licensed marriage and family therapist out of Vegas, specializing Mm -hmm. in LGBTQ plus affirmative practices. Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. You are wonderful. Yes. You, you remind us of you. this every time we speak to you. Thank you all for having me on. It's very important that we talk to experts, as Dan Radcliffe said. And so I was very happy to be here. And um, like I said, I did write a piece on this. And if anyone like wants to chat with me, the host know my contact. And so uh, this conversation doesn't have to end now. I'm part of the fandom. Yeah. You can find me online if you need any help. Yeah, we will link to your social media and your Medium article in our show notes today. Bye, Sarah. Have a good weekend. Bye. Take care. To start wrapping things up here, any more comments, guys, on how we're going to treat Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling going forward or where we go from here as fans? I'm just disappointed because there seemed to have been a real opportunity to, I don't know, level with people instead of doing very misdirecting kind of manipulative things. And our author, our queen has not taken that route of providing like a singular argument and has just kind of rambled and caused and spread the very fear that we see being enacted in social policies uh, in governments across the world now. So I just kind of want to me leaving things, just saying I'm disappointed that this has occurred, that it, I think Joe somewhere in there is smart enough to not have done this. Uh, and I'm just really bummed out. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to read the books as often as I would normally or discuss them as often as I would normally, but it's, I'm, I'm really at the point where I'm looking for different voices, diverse voices, diverse artists and authors to support because I feel like I've spent so much of my life. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't, wasted but i've spent a lot of life supporting people whose views i now know to be problematic and Mm -hmm. i wish i could throw some money towards people that actually need it i would like to part by saying that you know everyone all of us here all of you at home your relationship to harry potter and the wizarding world is yours and it is up to you what that looks like And what makes you comfortable? Um, This, what we talked about today, we certainly feel very strongly about this. But at the same time, we're not saying that you should not have a relationship with J.K. Rowling's work that makes you comfortable. Um, So we're not going to judge anybody if they decide they want to continue, for example, reading future works that J.K. Rowling puts out. That's a very personal choice. Um, we just hope that as you know, you continue your journey, that this is a point of view that you keep in mind. That's a great point. And for me, I, I know I touched on this earlier, but there's a lot to be said um, for the educational piece of this. And I think Sarah hit it right on the head when she was talking about, you know, sometimes being an ally and learning new things is uncomfortable and it should be. And I think that what we're talking about right now is it may even be more uncomfortable for people because especially here in the United States, it's already layered on societal issues that are going on where people are uncomfortable and they're realizing that there's been a lot of social injustice that has gone on in this country for quite a period of time. And it's, I I think, in a way, it's an awakening for a lot of people to realize that they don't know what they don't know. And it's time to sit down and have conversations and learn in order for us to be able to move forward. The last point I want to make is in the show notes, we're going to link to a thread by somebody on Twitter named Andrew James Carter, who broke down JK Rowling's blog post uh, point by point. And why I want to share it is because he actually used evidence and facts and and shared a lot of data, unlike J.K. Rowling. And I think it's important to read that 
because you'll understand um, that unlike J.K. Rowling, Andrew James Carter put a lot of thought into his response to J.K. Rowling, and I think it's important to get the full picture, and he provides that. So we'll include a link to the show no- in the show notes as well. Next week, we won't talk about this. <laughs> we will return to chapter by chapter um, and celebrate the Harry Potter fandom as we always do. And if you have any feedback about today's discussion, of course, we would love to hear it, no matter which side you are on. Uh, you can email mugglecast at gmail.com or use the contact form on mugglecast.com. And then, of course, you can send us a voice memo or you can use the voicemail line, 19203 Muggle. That's 19203684453. 368 Chapter 32, Out of the Fire which would have been an appropriate title for this episode too, I think. <laughs> we'll finally get back to that umbrage suck count and hopefully cross 100. I think I, I, think I pushed it across the 100 mark. Not, not to tease ahead to next week, but you know, I was working on, on that chapter analysis before this all Came went up. down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. She, she sucks a lot in the next uh, yeah. chapter. We can definitely accomplish 100. <laughs> bare minimum all right thank you everybody for listening we appreciate it and to those who have been skeptical of the outrage if you've made it this far into the episode we appreciate you too uh we know this is a hard conversation to be had but we felt very strongly about this and this is why we've spent uh nearly two hours in today's episode talking about this and we hope some people's minds have been changed if not that's okay we still respect you and and love you thanks everybody for listening i'm andrew i'm eric I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. Bye, everybody. Take care, y'all.